Hello again, I'm John Heverling, retired pastor and teacher of scripture at Santa Cruz Community Church. Very glad to be with you again today. Uh, we're studying in the book of James, and uh, uh, last time we met, I, I talked a lot about the some of the controversy about the book of James, uh, who wrote it, when did they write it, to whom did they write it, um, and, and some concern about some of the things it says. Does the book of James teach salvation by works? Uh, I don't think it does. But anyway, as I teach, it's in the Bible. It's the you, you Bible you have in your hands has the book of James in it. And my, I think the best thing that I do, and I would suggest you do, is read the book and ask yourself, does this sound like this is something God wants me to consider? And certainly it does for me, as I, we covered two chapters last time. And, even in those two chapters, James has a way of, of checking me and said, I'm saying, you know, I, I really need to think more thoroughly, more carefully about that and practice. I think the book of James, I said last time, seems to be kind of a, a group of, of almost separate subjects. He seems to jump from one thing to another. And yet when you read the book through, you'll see, I think you'll see what I see, that uh, actually the subject of the book is living the Christian life, living it, not just talking it. Uh, and, and I think that's part of the answer to why James does not again stress the, the, the central gospel doctrines that we find in, in other parts of Scripture. So we're beginning with the third chapter today. Let me say that, um, so I don't forget to say this, that uh, we at, at uh, Santa Cruz Community Church are back meeting live again, meeting together. So I'm back to teaching my classes live with, uh, with folks there to ask questions and share. So I'm, I want to continue our survey till we finish the whole New Testament. Uh, but there may be gaps, there may be times when uh, I, I, we skip a week. So if there's a week then you don't find a new study, just hang on, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So uh, when you think about the book of James, one of the, the passages that many people are familiar with and talk about is this third chapter, the beginning of the third chapter, where James has this discussion of the tongue uh, what we do with the tongue. Uh, but I think, uh, though, though it's very dramatic the way he puts it in some of his illustrations and, and uh, explanations are very gripping, uh, they should be. I think the, the uh, James is on a subject we need to be concerned about, the, the proper use of the tongue. But he starts out with uh, saying, uh, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, brothers and sisters, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. I don't think James is trying to discourage people from being teachers of the Word of God. He's trying to check, say, have you appointed yourself to be a teacher when you really don't know the, the material, when the Lord has not called you and equipped you to be a teacher. Um, and, and as you follow through in what he said before and what he continues to say here, you see that it's this idea all over and again, whatever he's talking about, it's this idea of, is it real? Are you living it? Is it really from God or is it something you're doing for your own, to satisfy your own purposes? Uh, are you are you teaching the word of God as it's written, uh, corrective as it is, and, and encouraging as it is? Are you teaching it in a way to to make yourself look like an expert, to make to put yourself up so people say, "Oh my, he's a teacher," uh, you know? Okay, so he says we all stumble in many ways. 
That's, that's certainly true. When I read James, I see he really knows what's happening in my life and in your life. Uh, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Uh, what he's saying is, if you think about it, the words we speak, the way we communicate with each other, really tells who we are. And if that's out of kilter, then then everything is out of kilter. And if it, if you, the, the way you speak and the things you say and the way you communicate with others is is strong and healthy, then the, the, everything about you is healthy. So then he, he, he begins to use these illustrations. Uh, one that the ancient people would be familiar with, and if you're a farm person, or uh, even if you ride horses for uh, entertainment, for enjoyment, you, you know that the horse is a big animal, much stronger physically than the person who's riding it. And yet, James says, uh, when we put a bit into the mouth of the horse, to, they, we make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal uh, early on in, in domesticating and using horses, it was learned that if you put this bit in their mouth and connect it to the straps, that, that the, the horse's mouth is very tender. And so when you pull on the strap and, the, and you, 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 the mouth is pulled in a direction, the horse goes in that direction. You can control the horse that way. Then he, he jumps to another illustration. He says, you look how large a ship is out in the water, and yet you can turn the ship with the, with the rudder, uh, and the rudder is really a small thing compared to the whole ship, and yet, uh, although they are so large, the ships and are driven by strong winds, he's still talking about sailing ships in that day, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot, the, the steersman, wants to go. So he says, this is like the tongue. If you control the tongue and you, you are thoughtful about the, what the tongue is saying and doing, the, the whole of, of your person, the whole of who you are, is steered by that. Um, so. He, he then kind of talks about the tongue as if it were, you know, as if the tongue itself uh, decided what to say. Well, that's not true. It's really the brain that decides what to say. But the tongue is, is there in the middle of, of speaking. So likewise, he says, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Uh, you, you judge the, the character and the intention of the whole person by what the tongue says. Consider what a great forest fire is set by a small spark. Boy, are we aware of that as we get back toward another fire season and we're being told that uh, we have to be very careful with fire. So we know his illustration that a bit of a, of, of a of fire, uh, an untended fire, campfire, even a cigarette thrown away that's burning can start a great fire. A tiny little starting flame becomes great big. So uh, he says, the tongue is, is also a fire, his illustration. A world of evil among the parts of the body <clears throat> this term world is used uh, uh, the, sometimes when we say God so loved the world, uh, when we talk about the beauties of the world and God created the world, we're speaking positively, but uh, the scriptures often talk about the world in terms of the, the, the society, the, the atmosphere of society, and um, um, the, the world is often in conflict to God. God is wanting people to go one direction and the world is wanting them to go another. So the tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. 
And you have to let James be, you know, let his illustration be understood, not make more of this than it's intended. Uh, that, that the tongue, the way a person speaks, the things they say, their communication, it tells you whether they are following the way of the world or the way of God. And he says, the tongue can become a world of evil, the evils that are, that are around us that are of the world and of the devil uh, can, can make themselves known and shown through uh, the, the tongue. Uh, the tongue, if you use it this way, corrupts the whole body. What he means is that when you find someone who is speaking hatefully, who is speaking uh, in a way that's that's uh, disrespectful of, of God and of your fellow man, this uh, this sets the tone. You see that person coming, and you 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 characterize that person by what they say. So it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Uh, this this is a very dramatic. Uh, passage and uh, uh, James is wanting to shake us a bit on on the seriousness of the things we say and the way we speak and the way we communicate who we are uh, <clears throat> so uh, then he, he jumps to this other application of this that all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles uh, and creatures of the sea are being tamed uh, now, you know, we, we're aware that you can only tame something to a certain degree, and yet he says, see how humankind, God, sort of gave the, the whole of his nature into the hands of human beings, and human beings are able to manage, even, even very fierce wild animals can be managed and tamed to a degree. So <clears throat> man has, has learned to tame the, the creatures around him, even though they are stronger in many ways than he is. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. <clears throat> now, that's a very strong passage. And it does call us to check our, our use of the tongue and our language, but uh, you shouldn't get carried away with applying it and, and uh, try to make it say something that he didn't intend to say. Then he goes on and he says how he sees this, the tongue's use being so uh, detrimental is, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with the tongue we curse men. Uh, he says that's not the way it should be men who are made in, in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praising and cursing. Uh, the inconsistency, the, the, one of the biggest things that people who are wanting to live in a, a godly life are criticized for is, is being ungodly in, in some of their ways and then trying to look very godly at other times and in other ways. <clears throat> he says, my brothers, this should not be. And then a, a final illustration, uh, uh, can fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Now we have fresh water and we have salt water. And they're different and you need to understand their difference. And you can't <clears throat> find a, a spring uh, where water is coming out of the, out of the ground and find it to be both sweet water and salt water at the same time. Uh, a fig, does a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Uh, that uh, Jesus, we, we remember, speaks very strongly about you, you recognize what a tree is by what fruit it, it has and that uh, uh, one kind of tree can't bear a different kind of fruit. So we are judged by the fruit of our lives. So uh, now he, he seems to change subjects dramatically, but he really hasn't. He's, he's talking about what we say and do and what 
what the essence of life is about with the tongue, watch out for the tongue in this. And then he switches to talking about wisdom. But this is again, what are we saying? What are we doing? Uh, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Uh, this deeds runs through James but he's not saying that you're saved by your good works. He's saying what Paul said in, in uh, Ephesians 2, that you're saved not by works, but by grace and faith. But, the, but then the grace and faith produce works that God intends to flow from those who know him. So uh, if you, brother, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly. Uh, this the same thing with the use of the word world that he's saying. Uh, you know, it belongs here. You know, he's, Jesus says, us pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. But it isn't. Uh, the earth is often dominated by that which isn't God's will. So it's earthly, unspiritual of the devil uh, for where you have envy uh, and selfish ambition there you find disorder in every evil practice and he's saying look at, at what you're really doing what you're really communicating with the way you live and the things you say and you, you can't have it both ways either you are really seeking God's way or you're following the world's and the devil's way. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. A passage like this really grips me and I think, okay, what am I doing and saying? And the idea that there is a wisdom of sorts that comes from the world, same thing Paul says to the Corinthians, there is a wisdom that comes from the world, but that wisdom is self-asserting. It, it's clever. It manipulates things to come out the way the person who is manipulating wants them. But the wisdom that comes from God, he says, you can tell it because it's pure. It's not mixed with selfish desires and, and uh, mixed motives. And then it's peace-loving. Um, boy, we, we really realized in our world that this business of being peace-loving uh, is, is so important. It is considerate. It, it is not uh, selfish and, and, and trying to put others down that you might seem by that means to lift yourself up. It's considerate. It's submissive. Uh, Paul uses this word submission a lot, that we're, we're ones who are willing to be molded as God wants us to be. We're not uh, the ones who want to mold others to our way. Submissive. Full of mercy. Mercy is a great Old Testament word uh, that kind of links with the New Testament frequent use of the word grace. But here, James, uh, in, as we said last at our last session, the James who writes this is strongly um, background of Jewish thought and Jewish uh, understandings, and so full of mercy. Uh, this is the, the quality that comes of, from God. And good fruit, again, this idea that he had earlier and that Jesus has, that when you really are being cultivated by God to be the, what God wants you to be, your life produces good fruit. The good things come from that life. Uh, impartial, uh, he's talked earlier about uh, are you, do you lean toward those who are rich and powerful and 
you don't care anything about those who are poor and do not have worldly power. No, you're impartial. A person is a person, no matter who that person is. And sincere, uh, definitely James talks about sincerity. Peacemakers, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called sons of God. He says, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. That you're gonna have to dwell on that sentence that he says you can't plant one thing and grow another. Paul says the same thing in the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter. What you sow, you reap. And, and James is saying, when you sow in this wisdom from God, this peaceable, uh, considerate wisdom that listens to other people and, and speaks softly and, and persuasively but, and consistently but not aggressively and, and argumentatively and critically. Um, so peacemakers who sow in that kind of way that God teaches are the ones who find a harvest of righteousness. Uh, what, what they do produces that uh, righteousness that God wants. Uh, then as we begin the fourth chapter, he, this really grips me. He says, where, where do these fights and quarrels among you come from? Why are we all such quarrelsome people? And, and always at odds with each other. And he says, where does it come from? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Isn't it that restless desire for self-attainment and self-gratification that, that puts you at odds with other people who are also wanting to gratify their selves, push their agenda? And when these two agendas bump into each other, you have quarrels, of course. Um, you want something, but don't get it. Now you kill and covet. We say, well, we don't actually kill people. Well, in our world, people are killed every day because of these disagreements and problems among us. We are a people who know how to kill people who don't disagree with us. So you kill and covet. Coveting is a, you know, the last of the Ten Commandments is you shall not covet. You shall not want to take something that belongs to somebody else. Yes, there is a command against stealing, but the coveting gets at more at the root of it. You have it. I want it. I'm going to somehow figure out how to get it. You kill and, and covet. Um, you you, uh, but you cannot have what you want. Even, even this way, you still don't get your own way. You quarrel and fight. You do not have what you want because you do not ask God. Uh, this is a very Christian idea, but a very godly idea, even back into the Old Covenant scriptures. If you want something, you ask God. And if God chooses to give it to you, if God feels it's good for you, then you praise him for it. He says you, you try to get it on your own you, by, by your own human strengths and, and ways, and, but you don't get it. And you don't have what you really need, not, not the excessive, not, you know, not the things you covet, but the things you really need, you don't have because you don't ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasure. Uh, you, you can see James's point here and you can feel the, the need of the correction in your own life that we, we want something. Uh, yes, you can work for it and you can get things by working for them. But basically, the things we most need, we get from God, not from his gracious gifts. The best things in life really are free if you, if you see life in the right way. So uh, you ask of God, and God gives, and then you praise God for it. Uh, 
Romans, I'm studying Romans on Wednesday night with my group again. God says that the basic sin of mankind is not recognizing God, not uh, thanking God, not praising God, not asking God's will. So um, now then he, he's very uh, critical here, but it's, he sounds very much like an Old Testament prophet. You adulterous people. He doesn't mean that literally. He doesn't mean that this is a sexual sin thing. He means you are supposed to be, as it is, a, a partner of God. You're supposed to be married as, as it was to God. This was Old Testament teaching. Israel was to be the wife of God. And, uh, but instead, they chose other gods. They were like an unfaithful wife who chooses other partners. So this is the spiritual adultery, the, you adulterous people. I think the King James says, makes it male and female, but the, the text itself just has a female form. That doesn't mean it's aimed at women rather than men. It means that it's, it, the illustration is an unfaithful wife, an unfaithful partner. Uh, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Now you have to watch out for how you handle this. Friendship with the world. Of course we're friends with the world. We're friends with people in the world. We were, we're told to be friends with them. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the neighbor, Jesus says in his parable, reaches out to everybody who needs, whether they're exactly like you or not. I always want to remember that the neighbor in, the, in Jesus' story was a Samaritan and the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. And yet Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero of his parable. So friendship with the world, and again, this is the sense of that ungodly world, that world that's not all for itself and, and not for the ways of God. Uh, when, you, when you choose that kind of friendship, that's where you, you, you point your life, I want to be like them, uh, then this becomes this spiritual adultery. I turn my back on God and I face the world. And, and I don't really want to, to uh, hear from God, I want to hear from the world. So friendship with the world, uh, Jane and John in his letter, when we get to it, goes further and says, love not the world and the things that are in the world. So anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world, uh, chooses the world's kind of ways and companionships, becomes an enemy of God. Uh, if you really boil it down, you can see what James is saying that you have to choose what life you want and who you want to associate with? Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he causes to live in us envies intensely? Uh, that takes a little thought. Uh, that really the old, old covenant scriptures talk about God being a jealous God. He doesn't want to share your love and worship with things that are not God with the false gods, which essentially always comes back to the devil's desire to be God and to have you worship him. So um, uh, the scripture says that there is this envy. Now, enviousness among ourselves is sinful and wrong and dis disruptive. But the sense that God wants all of our worship Love, oh, love the Lord your God with all your strength and all your soul and all your heart. So uh, the spirit, the scripture says, and, and he doesn't quote a particular scripture, he just says generally. Now he's talking about the old covenant scriptures generally point out to us that there is this intense envy in the part of God wanting us for himself wanting us, he, us, wanting him to be our only God. But he gives us more grace 
That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, Old Testament, New Testament, God opposes the proud, those who are self-assertive and want to be in control of everything. But the humble, he blesses. Now, you have to see how he blesses them. So submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Oh, I love James telling us that. You, you can't say the devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do it. He can lead you to do it. He can uh, encourage you to do it. But you have to make the decision. And, the, and, and if you resist the devil, he flees from you, especially if you resist him in the power of God and with the Holy Spirit that's within you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Uh, you turn your life to God and God recognizes that and turns his face to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Uh, you go way back to the first chapter and he talks about the person who doesn't really know which way he wants to go. Uh, he doesn't really pray in faith. He, he prays. And then he, he works on it himself in, in the flesh. Um, the flesh and the world are connected in Scripture. So he says, uh, if you really want to be God's people, uh, you sinners, that's all of us, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Don't be the world and God. And I really want the world, but I don't want to not have God uh, double-minded you grieve mourn and wail now we don't like this and yet uh, there's a place for it uh, change your laughter to mourning uh, you know you can't laugh everything off you can't just uh, laugh at everything that there is out there laugh with the world no he says there's a time that you need to mourn about what's happening in your own life and in the lives of others. Joy is a good thing. We're told over again to rejoice in the Lord, always to rejoice, but the joy of the world needs to be turned at times to gloom. You need to get serious and see things as they are. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. That's a great statement. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in his way. Now, then we have what seems to be a direct quote from something Jesus said. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. Uh, if if uh, you take it upon yourself to be the judge, you're sort of setting aside the law of God and and taking it upon you. When you judge the, the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment of it. Well, there's a, certainly a willingness around us to say, oh, God shouldn't say that. He can't say that. He can't mean that. We judge God and judge his law rather than letting it judge us. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy Jesus says, don't think about the, the life as if you was all in your hands, but think about God who has the, the final judgment. Uh, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Jesus speaks about judging. Now we have to judge what's right and wrong. We have to judge to that degree. But to, to set ourselves up as the judge of our neighbor, I think Paul says, you know, why do you judge the servant of someone else? He's the one who, if he's a servant as a master, his own master will judge him. And, and he says, um, quotes the Old Testament that uh, judgment belongs to God. Wait upon God's judgment. Don't do it yourself. So... Um, then this interesting passage about uh, 
not uh, saying what I will do. Uh, now listen, he, often he has this phrase that means pay attention, listen to what I'm saying. Over and over again he uses this phrase. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. There's nothing wrong with carrying on business and making money. There's something wrong with feeling that I, I am in total command here and I will do this and I will assert my strength and make money for me, you know. Why do you not, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? Uh, the stock market does crash and people who are depending on it are left out. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had no idea we were going to enter into a time of a, a very serious modern day plague that would change everything about life. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I understand that you're not here for long in God's sense. A uh, hundred years for God is just a, a passing time. So you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Now you can say this kind of, as a, oh, if God wills, but do we really mean it? Do we really mean I will accept what God wills? Sometimes it seems what's happening to us is so bad, and yet when we have a chance then to look back on it later, we see that God allowed it because there was good in it for us. We should look at what we're going through now um, in, the, in the epidemic that we are having in the, in the political situations. God allows things because we need to be shaken down. So it is as it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Ooh, that verse has been with me since I first started reading scripture. It's not just the thing, if I do something that, this, that God's will says I shouldn't do, that's a sin. If I don't do something that God says I should do, that's a sin, the sin of omission rather than the sin of commission. And, and this is a very wise point that James makes. Uh, we need to judge our lives by what we, not just by what we do, as if you just sat back and did nothing. That, that would please God. No, what is it that we're supposed to be doing? The fifth chapter has some interesting things. We have to hurry along and get done here for today, for this time. Uh, James seems to have a thing about rich people and, and you can get too much carried away with that and uh, have the idea that anybody who has money must be bad. Uh, now I'll read the, the last chapter of First Timothy and you see Paul doesn't see it that way. Jesus didn't see it that way. He didn't, uh, he didn't see that anybody who had money was bad. Uh, but what the money does to you and what you do to the money is where the bad comes in. So, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. James is basically saying uh, that having money will, will bring its own curse, and, and especially if you've got it by mistreating other people. Uh, your wealth has rotted uh, Jesus says, put your treasures where they can't be rotted by moth and rust. And the, James says, your money will, will get you in that way. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Oh, very strong statement, but it's, it's a worthy warning. If you live for money, money isn't a very good God. So, uh, you've hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, there's that word again that he uses. Watch out, are you paying attention? The wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. 
those who get wealth by abusing other people, God takes note. Uh, the, the, what you're doing cries out to God. The cries of the harvest men have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. And you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Remember that the animal who gets fattened up eventually gets slaughtered. Uh, kind of a tough illustration, but uh, you have condemned and murdered innocent men. Uh, you murder more than just actually hitting them over the head with a club or stabbing them with a knife. Uh, you do things that cause men to suffer and die. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Now, some have said, well, this, this is basically his indictment of them for murdering Jesus, the innocent one who did not oppose them, who did not speak back and defend himself. Yes, that becomes the ultimate a sin, the ultimate recognition of who and what we are. But I think James is applying it in a more general way, that any man who you use because he doesn't or can't fight back, uh, and so that innocence that you have abused, God will take note of. Then um, what seems to be a, an abrupt shift of subject, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. Uh, those who said, well, this doesn't seem like a distinctly Christian book. Maybe he's talking in the Old Testament sense of God finally coming to judge the world. But no, he's talking about Jesus returning to set things in order as he sees them until the Lord's coming. Then he, he says, see how a farmer, uh, Paul talks the same way to Timothy, see how a farmer plants, and then he has to wait for the, for the growth of the, of the harvest. He has to wait for the early rains and the late rains. He says, you too be patient and stand firm because the, Lord of, the Lord's coming is near. Uh, now near, we've always said, wait a minute, it's been couple thousand years and it hasn't happened yet. Well, we'll get eventually to Second Peter where Second Peter says, don't think God is being negligent. He's being patient and giving you more time. Uh, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. I think, you know, even in our day, we should realize that Jesus is aware of what's going on in the world, and he's standing at the door, and at the time of his choosing, he can come and stop what's happening, but it's a time of his choosing. Then, um, very Old Testament influenced here, but that's, that's not bad. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Jeremiah, for one, you know, the prophet who was God's man, and yet it got him all kinds of misery in this world. Uh, but all of the prophets were opposed. Uh, Elijah was hunted down by the evil king and queen. So he says, see, read the, the, the prophets whom you admire and who spoke for God. See the life they lived. See the example of patience and waiting on the Lord, those who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. Uh, they, because, think about Elijah, because he continued to do what God wanted him to do in spite of the opposition and the danger. We consider blessed those who persevered. You've heard of Job's persistence. King James says patience again, but it's not, not a good translation of that word. Job, if you read Job, he wasn't patient. Uh, he, he talked back to his supposed friends and their views. He talked back to God, uh, he, but he was persistent. He believed in God, he believed God would ultimately write things, and he waited. 
We have a song that we like that talks about 39 chapters later, Job saw that God really was God and would do his will. Uh, you have heard of Job's paid persistence and have seen what the Lord literally finally brought about. Well, the, kind of the point of the book of Job is that God allowed Satan to make Job's life a, a, a living hell, a, mir a misery, and yet in the end, God blessed Job. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Uh, above all, my brothers, do not swear. Here again, we see James sort of quoting Jesus. Uh, don't swear by the heaven or by the earth. Uh, let your yes be yes and your no, no, and you will, or you will be condemned. You know, if you are telling a lie and you try to put it off by saying, I swear to God, you know, no, you don't swear to God. God knows you're lying. But you, it's impressive to the person you're talking to. Cross my heart and hope to die, you know, as mm -hmm. kids think. But don't, don't do that. Just say, this is what I say. This is the truth. This is yes. This is no. And stick by it. And if you start uh, trying to get around things by these phrases, this swearing kind of thing, uh, it becomes evil. Then his last Per paragraphs. Uh, is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. That's great advice, great counsel. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. The Old Testament people were singing people. The New Testament people are singing people. But sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church. Now here he uses the word ecclesia for church, the usual New Testament term. He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Now don't get too carried away with the anointing of oil and, and try to make that the big thing. Are you saying if you don't do that, if you don't anoint with oil, God won't hear? No, the, the text specifically says it's the prayer of faith. The anointing with oil is useful if it's done as an act of faith. And, and in a way, uh, you could read this passage, uh, some have, that uh, this is, the anointing with oil was part of what they did Medicinally, if you had an ache, they rubbed oil on it. Uh, the Good Samaritan found the man bruised and injured, poured wine and oil on his body to soothe it. Uh, so this, and it's really, it isn't the word anoint, it's the word rub here that, uh, so, but the elders of the church, the idea that the leaders of the church would come and, and, and would minister to this person, uh, would pray for them, and, and their prayer would uh, allow the Lord to heal, would cooperate with the Lord's healing, and would point out to us that it is the Lord who heals. We may do what we do, the doctors do what they do, but it is the Lord who provides healing. And if you've sinned, the idea that sin can be connected, and it can, with, with physical maladies. You can bring these things on yourself. But if you have sinned, the sin will be forgiven. God is the forgiver of sins when we... Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Uh, this, this, again, should not be taken to the extreme in confession. Just the openness, the willingness to be who you are and to accept who you are and, and speak that way to each other. Confess your sins to each other. Uh, this is not really a good verse to uh, uh, say that there's, there's the official person, the priest that you confess to. This says confess to each other. Don't put on ears with each other. Be who you are. 
And the prayer of, of, the, of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Then he uses Elijah as the example. Elijah the prophet, but uh, he, he was not a powerful man in any way except as God gave him power. But when he prayed, the rain stopped at God's choosing. And then when he prayed again, the rain came back. Uh, he prayed and the heavens gave rain. The earth produced its crops. You just don't need to go back and read that passage and see what he's saying about Isaiah and the power that God gave him. So he says, pray because God still gives power. Then his closing thought, my brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth, uh, back when he talks about not being, not many of you being teachers, uh, you can wander from the truth, you can be led away from the truth, but going away from the truth is a serious thing. And someone should bring him back if you have helped someone to come back to the truth. Uh, remember this, Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death. Uh, the, the, the turning, the, what the sinner does in response to your teaching and encouragement will save from death. Then this last sentence, and cover over a multitude of sins. Is James saying you, you can have God forgive your own sins by this kind of thing? Or is he saying, this person has sinned, but those sins will be covered over. They will be put aside and forgotten by God. Uh, we certainly see that this is the New Testament teaching. It's the Old Testament teaching. The only one who can sin, can, can get rid of sin is God himself, because ultimately all sin is a sin against God. So James closes with the idea that uh, you need to, by what you do and say and the way you behave and communicate with each other, help people to come away from their sin and come back to God. And by doing that, a multitude of sins will be put away and covered. Uh, so that's the way James closes his book. And that's the way we will close this study for now. And next, when I gather with you, we'll look into a beautiful, meaningful book by Peter, the book of 1 Peter. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We read it so that it will help us to see your ways and to live your ways and correct us when we need correcting and encourage us when we need encouragement. So give your blessing to the study and and the application of your word in Jesus' name, amen.